Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Convocation. Here we are headlong into the, uh, in the midst of our Convocation series, but we are so thankful today for our speaker and our guest, uh, because today is a special day. This is actually, we're in the midst of Spiritual Emphasis Week, which has been going on at the university for a long time, way uh, predates me. Um, but some years ago, about eight years ago, I think eight or nine years ago, we launched a, a particular lecture, a lecture series, but a lecture on behalf of Dr. Carol Grizzard Browning. Uh, for some of you now, students maybe had never heard about Carol or have never had her in a class because Carol retired in 2011. But let me give you a little background to who Carol is. Uh, Carol Grizzard Browning, a PhD, is Professor Emeritus of Religion at UPike. She served as an advisor to our academic team, published scholarly articles, including Kingship in Israel, and um, wrote uh, notes for the New Interpreter Study Bible, uh, took, uh, took a trip to Spain, um, but because of a sudden illness, Carol uh, was forced to retire um, in 2011. So one thing that a, a previous student had said about Carol was this, as genuine a person and a teacher as I've ever met, Carol has always uh, shared something special with her students, herself. It was clear each time she lectured that she taught from her heart. Her passion for the subject and for the students was unquestionable. Inside and outside of the classroom, Dr. Grizzard especially expressed interest in her students, and, she, and I personally benefited from her caring spirit and words of encouragement um, and wisdom. So we are so excited to be able to honor Carol today. And our um, special lecturer today is Dr. Ryan Burge, who is an assistant professor of political science as well as, well as graduate coordinator at Eastern Illinois University, where his, where his research focuses largely on the interaction of religiosity and political behavior, particularly in the American context. Having published over 20 articles in a uh, great span of peer-reviewed journals, which you'll see the list there. He's also the author of the book, The Nuns, where they came from, who they are, and where they're going. This is why Ryan's with us today, because of this book and this great cutting-edge research. But also, Ryan's been all over the place on media, media from the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, Christian Today, also is a frequent contributor to Re Religion in Public, which is a forum for scholars of religion and politics to make their work more accessible for a general audience. And in all of his spare time, uh, he is a pastor of an American Baptist church, having served for over 13 years. Um, and just being a pastor in the midst of COVID and everything was all 2020, uh, that's an accomplishment in and of itself. So um, also you can follow Ryan on Twitter at, uh, at Ryan Burge or on his website, ryanburge.net. Without further ado, uh, let's turn it over uh, to Dr. Ryan Burge. What an introduction. Oh, that was terrific. Thank you for that. Let me share my screen. Do, do, do. Here we go. Okay. So, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm going to just talk for a few minutes, then I'm going to do some questions and answers at the end. Um, so, a lot of, lot of ground to cover. Let's get right to it. There's the book that Rob talked about, The Nuns, Where They Came From, Who They Are, Where They're Going. You can buy it everywhere the books are sold, also in Barnes & Noble at the store. The book started as where all good books start with a tweet. This is the I sent it out in uh, March of 2019. I had a very inconsequential Twitter account to that point. I think I had seven or 800 followers. Um, no one really knew who I was. I didn't know who I really was at that point. I just made some graphs and sent them out. And then that graph goes out. And it, I don't know what your definition of viral is, but from an academic standpoint, it went viral. Um, it got retweeted, you know, 12, 1300 times. And then every reporter in America wanted to call me and talk about religion um, in America. And so I was on the front page of CNN, the New York Post, the, uh, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Times of London called. Um, my graph was recreated in basically every major media outlet in America. Um, my tweet made the front page of Reddit got 71,000 upvotes and people were emailing me who hadn't seen me since high school saying, I saw you on this and I saw you on that. And I did a C-SPAN morning of 2019, all in the wake of that. And, and really the graph is just, it's this is, is the graph that I tweeted out. Um, 
and it's it really changed everything in terms of how people think about the world around them, how they think about the religious world around them. And obviously the biggest change here is that kind of purplish line that tracks no religion has gone up and up and up um, while other groups have either stayed stable or gone down over time. And people were amazed by that. And they wanted to talk about how America lost its religion. So whenever Fortress approached me about six months later, asking if I had any book ideas, I didn't want to try to recreate the wheel or try to make people interested in something they weren't interested in. I thought, let's just talk about something they're already interested in, maybe in a way they've never seen it before. And that's really what the book's all about. So let's knock, just knock out a couple of these, you know, lines, just kind of in a little bit more closely. These are the nuns. Um, in 1972, about one in 20 American adults had no religious affiliation. They were so small that we couldn't even really do anything with them statistically in a survey. Um, there'd be about 100 of them in a survey of about 2,000 people, and you can't really do much. You can't break it down by age or gender or race when there's only 100 people to begin with. Um, 20 years later, they'd grown 7%. Still, not much to be done with a group that's 7% of the population in a smaller sample, but from there, from about 1990 forward, the share of Americans who said they're nuns is just sort of hockey stick growth. Um, every year, it seems like they go up 1% or 2 or or 3%. And according to the GSS, about 23% of Americans today um, say they have no religious affiliation, which means they are the same size as evangelicals or Roman Catholics. Um, and the trajectory, at least the 2020, 2021 data, actually puts them at 28.5% of nuns in the GSS. I, I'm not going to put my, put my career on the line for that yet, but I will say they are growing very, very rapidly. Um, just a couple other groups real quick. Evangelical Protestants. Um, they are actually larger today than they were in 1972. Um, in my new book, not to publicize too much, but 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America, which comes out next March, the first myth is that evangelicals are in decline. Um, they are not in decline. Um, they are actually larger than they were 46 years ago. The share of Americans who say they're born again has never been higher than it is right now. Um, it's really a misnomer to think that they're in decline. They're doing just fine. Um, thank you. Catholics. Catholic numbers are very, very, very stable. Um, you know, they kind of bounce around a little bit, but they've always tried to right have been around 25% or so. They've kind of declined a little bit in the last few years. Um, the big issue with Catholics is in 72, 55% of Catholics said they went to mass every week, and now it's 25% say they go to mass every week. So they're not they're not shuffling off the label, they're shuffling off the religion. It's more of a cultural identifier than a theological identifier now. So now they're down to about 22, 23%. Um, and this is the big change. And let me just stop for a second and sort of describe what a mainline Protestant is because the average person hasn't heard that term before and I get asked about it all the time. Mainline Protestants are traditionally more uh, moderate or even liberal Christian traditions, predominantly white Christian traditions, things like the United Methodist Church, the Episcopalians, the United Church of Christ. Um, the Presbyterian Church USA, those are all uh, mainline Protestant churches. In 1975, 31% of all adult Americans were mainline Protestants. It was the largest tradition in the United States in 1975. And then about 13 years later, it went from 31% to 19%. And from there, it's gone from 19% to 10%. And if all projections hold up, which I think they will, mainline Protestants will probably be less than 5% of America in the next 10 to 15 years, as the average mainline Protestant is about 58 years old, and most of them will die off in the next 20 or 30 years, and they're not being replaced. Um, for instance, the Episcopal Church only uh, baptized 16,000 infants all of last year. They only have about 500,000 weekly attenders in the Episcopal Church. So this is the sort of moderate flavor of American Christianity is eroding very rapidly, even though they're doing fine because they're more conservative. The, the, the liberals and the moderates are the ones who are hurting. By the way, I say this without any sort of celebration because I'm an American Baptist pastor, which is a mainline tradition myself. And the church I'm a member of and a pastor of had 300 people in 1965, and we had nine last Sunday. Uh, we we're going to close probably in the next three or four years. The church I was at before that closed down. They, they tore the building down. The church I was a youth pastor before that was 150 when I was there, now 60 on a good Sunday. So this entire tradition is basically collapsing overnight, the mainline Protestant tradition. So why, why is this happening? You know, why are the nuns rising so rapidly? And as any good social scientist will tell you, it's complicated. It's never one thing. 
um, you know, those lists you see online, like the one secret trick that makes everyone mad or whatever, that doesn't work here. There's not one single solitary thing that you can say, well, that's it. Um, that's the thing that's causing this whole thing. Um, so I'm going to knock out just a couple of them real briefly here. Uh, the first is what's called secularization. And if you take any course in the sociology of religion, you've definitely heard about secularization theory. I think it's probably the most popular theory when it comes to um, religion uh, all over the world. It's, it's basically encapsulated in this. As a society becomes more educated and economically prosperous, it will become less religious. And the person who wrote that was a guy named Max Weber, the German sociologist, probably the most important social scientist to ever live. He wrote this. He wrote a book called um, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, which is uh, just tremendous work. He wrote, he's like the father of bureaucracy in the world. He's all over the place. But Weber said that, that this is an inevitable process, that societies, as they become you know, more upwardly mobile, they're going to become less religious. He used this German term for it which has been translated to the word disenchantment. But I like this uh, interpretation of the word, demagication. Um, Weber said that, you know, think about 300 years ago and it didn't rain for a week or a month or a year and you didn't know why. Or your wife all of a sudden started coughing twice and then three days later she was dead. Why did those things happen? You didn't know. You couldn't explain it. You didn't understand it because we had a very poor understanding of science even two or 300 years ago. And so why'd my wife die? Because she must have sinned against God or God must be punishing me or her for something. Or why is it not rain? Because our region must be godless or sinful. And that's why it didn't rain. And then we got meteorology and climatology and virology and bacteriology and all those things. And so now we know why people die because they get viruses and bacteria. We know why it doesn't rain because of climate change and, and weather patterns. So the more that we get science, according to Weber, the less that we need God. Um, and so that's you know, that's his uh, contribution to the whole thing. And then Karl Marx comes along and says, listen, you know what religion really is? He says it's all about class struggle, right? That what's happening here is pe rich people in society use religion as a tool to keep poor people poor and be happy about their poverty. Um, it's basically a weapon in this class struggle. And there's this famous quote from, you know, the Communist Manifesto, Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. It basically keeps people placated. Like I'm poor, but I'm happy because God's blessed me, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, as people got richer, they realized, wait, religion is keeping poor people down. We don't need it anymore. And we're going to throw that off. And if you look at Western Europe, you see sort of all the evidence for secularization you would need. Um, this is the percent of people attending church weekly in a lot of um, Eastern and Western European countries. Um, Poland's the outlier there. Poland's a very odd case because it's an Eastern Bloc country, but it's incredibly Catholic and half the people there go to church once a week. They're actually more religious in Poland than they are in America, uh, interestingly enough. I don't, there's your random fact of the day. Ireland's also very religious as well, but then you get to places like Italy, Spain, Austria, Switzerland, you know, a place like Germany where seven, 8% of people go to church once a week. You know, to put that in context in America, it's probably depending on how you measure it, between 25 and 30 percent. So, you know, much, much less religious there in Western Europe. And so that was going to come to America, is the understanding. Uh, and this is a scatter plot. On the, on the vertical axis, it's people who say that religion is very important. On the horizontal axis, it's the GDP per capita. So basically, this, this tests this assumption. You know, as, as, group, as countries become more economically advanced, do they become less religious? The answer is yes. Um, more economically advanced countries are less religious um, than countries that are less economically advanced. There are only two major outliers here. One is China. It should be a lot more religious than it is, and we all know why that is, because communism and atheism go hand in hand, and the, com and the communist government of China has done everything it can to make China less religious. And then the United States. Um, if we fit right on the trend line, according to this model, 0% of Americans would say religion is very important. Um, instead, 50% of Americans say religion is very important. So it's really kind of astounding that we are as religious as we are. We should be much less religious than we are right now. We're, we're stubbornly religious in this country. The other thing is what's called social desirability bias. And that is the, the simple fact that people on surveys lie about stuff. 
um, about everything, you know? So imagine you're taking a survey, you're looking someone else on the eye who might be your age, you might find them to be attractive or interesting and you want to impress them. And they ask you a question like, do you masturbate? Or do you do drugs? Are black people lazy? How many sexual partners have you had? Do you think a woman would make a good president? Obviously you're probably going to lie about some of those things, or at least downplay a little bit of those things in your life because you don't want to look like a weirdo or a racist or a sexist. Even though you might be, you just don't want to tell people that you're any of those things. So you lie about it. Well, how about this? How often do you go to church? People lie about that all the time. Um, and we know that for a fact, by the way. Um, in the book, I talk about this really interesting case study in Ashtabula County, Ohio. Um, was, it was put together by a guy named Kirk Hathaway, who was an Episcopalian researcher. And he had a whole research team go to Ashtabula County, Ohio. And first they did a mail survey. And they had a bunch of questions in the mail survey of people living in the county. And they asked, how often do you go to church? Well, on the survey, about 36% of people said that they attended church every week. Okay, 36%. Great. That's, that's very religious. And then Kirk Hathaway and his team goes, well, let's check. Let's, let's just see if they're lying or not. And so what they did was they got the phone book. This is back in the 90s when you still had phone books. They got a phone book, looked at every church in the county, and they called every pastor of every church in Ashtabula County and asked them how many people were in church last Sunday. And then made a whole spreadsheet, tallied up. And then some pastors didn't respond, so they actually drove the parking lots of their church the next Sunday and counted cars and created this formula, like number of cars equal number of people, which is a rough estimate, obviously, but everything's a guess here. And what they found through all that work was only about 20% of people in Ashtabula County actually attended church on an average Sunday. So basically about half of people who say they go to church lie about it. And so maybe what's going on with the nuns is they've always existed and they've always been very plentiful in American life. It's just people lied about it for a long time. And now what we're getting on these surveys is the real answer, not the socially desirable answer. And so I actually think this is a good thing from pastor's perspective, from social science perspective, we're actually getting closer to reality. And I think one thing that's predicated that on is the fact that a lot of these surveys now used to be face to face and now they've moved online. And we know that online surveys, people are actually more willing to say what they really think in an online survey because they don't have to look someone in the face and say, I don't go to church. So, you know, really what we're doing is we're getting closer to reality. Now, it's impossible to deny the impact that politics has had on religion in this country. Um, there's all these theories about how that works and why that works. Obviously, the big one is culture war. That's the one I think everyone knows is that you know evangelicals and Catholics are Republicans because of abortion and gay marriage and pornography and family values. That's sort of the oldest theory uh, that exists in the field, but that's not the only one. There are other theories. For instance, Randall Balmer, who just wrote a book about this, was published a couple months ago, uh, in this article in Politico basically argues that the religious right emerged because of racism. Um, he tells a story of Holmes County, Mississippi, um, after Brown versus Board, Holmes County, Mississippi had to desegregate their schools. Black kids and white kids had to go to the same school instead of separate schools. Well, within two years of the public school in Holmes County, Mississippi desegregating, there was not a single white kid that went to the public school in Holmes County. They all went to the private Christian school in Holmes County, Mississippi. Um, and the IRS revoked the nonprofit status of that school saying it was clearly, you know, the evidence is clear that it was basically a front to resegregate Holmes County. And, um, and then he tells a story of um, uh, Bob University, which by the way, until 2003, it was against uh, campus policy for interracial dating to happen on Bob Jones University's campus. And both those places got, Holmes County and Bob Jones got their tax exempt status revoked by the IRS. And so what Balmer says is the religious right was really pushing back against this. And basically, they would say it's about religious freedom, but really it's about racism and about segregation. Uh, one other theory uh, by Kevin Cruz in a really interesting book called One Nation Under God, where Kevin Cruz argues the religious right is really about capitalism. He tells these really interesting stories in that book about how these big co corporations would do contests for pastors to write the best sermons in support of capitalism, and the best sermons would get paid a huge prize, like $1,000 in 1947, which was a princely sum back in those days. Talks about how Billy Graham was basically propped up by major corporations, William Randolph Hearst especially. And so really the religious right got its, its um, backing from corporations who wanted low taxes. And then one more is Christian nationalism. 
which a great book by Perry and Whitehead basically argues that there's a whole sect of people in America who want America to be a Christian nation, a white Christian nation and advocate for white Christian values. Um, so all those are sort of, none of them are completely right. None of them are completely wrong. It's sort of an amalgam of all those things, but it's un, undeniable in the data that there's a strong connection between uh, political ideology and likelihood of, of being a nun. Um, for instance, uh, oh, let's see, only over 40, I think in the latest data, about 42 to 45 percent of liberals are nuns. Um, amongst those who lean liberal, it's 30. It's actually stair steps down just perfectly, like the way you would actually, I, I promise I didn't cook this data. This is exactly what it looks like. 40 percent liberal, but then amongst conservatives, only 10 percent. So in America, what we're figuring out is more and more people are realizing to be liberal is to be a nun and to be conservative is to be a Christian by and large, and an evangelical, which I've written about um, more recently. Other theories, just to hit on these real quick, one is the internet. I can't, I don't think we fully understand the impact the internet's had on every aspect of American society. I, in the book, I talk about, imagine you're an atheist in Mississippi born in 1940. You might live and die your entire life and never tell another single soul that you're an atheist in Mississippi in 1940. Why? Because you get kicked out of your family. You get kicked out of your community. You might lose your job. Um, you get ostracized, and we don't want to do that. But now you can go online and Google atheists in Mississippi and find a subreddit and a forum and a meetup and everything else, right? So now you don't feel like you're alone anymore and you can actually say what you really are. So kind of that social desirability piece kind of taken forward. Um, we can't discount the, uh, the bowling alone hypothesis, the Robert Putnam hypothesis, which is that Americans are just doing less social stuff in general. And the, the title of the book comes from his data where he finds that people don't bowl in bowling leagues anymore. They bowl alone by themselves. Um, and so, you know, that. what's funny is that book was written 20 years ago, and he blames cable television for this collapse of American community. I would say it's tweeting alone and Facebooking alone and Instagramming alone, right? It's So whatever Putnam saw 30 years ago, we've seen accelerated to an incredible degree over the last 10 or 15 years, and we're less social because of it. Um, trust in institutions. We can all know about the Tim and Tammy Faye Baker, uh, you know, scandal. We can talk about the Catholic Church scandal. Uh, we can talk about the lack of trust in institutions across the board, not just religious, but societal in general. Um, the thing, uh, the other thing I talk about is the the kind of the breakdown of the traditional family in American life. Um, marriage has become much less prevalent. Um, we're seeing, you know, the child-free movement take off. And in the book, I talk about how people who don't have kids and aren't married are much less likely to be uh, church members than those who are, you know, single moms, let's say, or, you know, those people don't come back to church or people who live together cohabitate, but are not married. Those people don't go to church either because of the, the sort of stigma that surrounds those ideas. So let's talk about demographics quick, age, gender, race, education, you know, all that kind of stuff. This is um, the religious composition of every generation from the silent generation, which is 1925 to 1945, all the way up to Generation Z, which are people born 1996 or later. So this is people who are young, or, uh, late teens, early 20s now is what we have them in the data. And as you can see, it's a pretty clear cascade, right? Away from Protestant Christianity largely, um, and an increase in the nuns, as you can see on the other side of the graph, 50% of the silent generation are Protestants and 22% are Catholic. So just over 70% of silent generation folks are Protestant or Catholic. And only 6% um, are atheists or agnostics, and 12% are nothing in particular. But if you go to the bottom of the graph, you see Generation uh, Z there, and you see that the share of that generation that are Protestants is now only 22%. Catholics are down to 15%. So combined together, 37% of Generation Z are Protestant or Catholic. On the other side, you got 32% of Generation Z who are nothing in particular and 13% who are atheists or agnostic, which means 45% of Generation Z are nuns and only 37% are Catholic or Protestant. They are, as best as we can tell, the first generation in the history of America where the nuns outnumber the Catholics and the Protestants. And um, that's obviously a dramatic shift from where we were just 20 or 30 years ago. Um, you know, if you look at it, this is the religious composition of America today amongst the general sample of adults, 18 
and up, up to 95-year-olds, I think, are in the sample. The number one religious group in America today are Protestants. About one-third of Americans today identify as Protestants, but about one in four identifies nothing in particular. Um, and then 18% are Catholics. And then everything else is in the single digits. Um, atheists are 6%. Agnostics are 5%. And I also want to make a point to point this out. The, those other religious groups, the ones we hear about a lot, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Muslims, actually make up a very small percentage of American life. I actually think they take an, on, an outsized role in American life. For instance, you know, the LDS community is about 1.2% of America and has been consistently that size for a very long time. Um, yet I just, you know, I, my wife told me there's the real housewives of Salt Lake City. Um, which is bizarre if you think about it because of how small a proportion. Salt Lake City, Utah is only 210,000 people. Tulsa, Oklahoma is 400,000. You know, I don't see any real housewives of Tulsa, Oklahoma happening anytime soon. So I think that these, these groups, while important, don't, I don't want to marginalize anybody. I just want to put them in proper context, okay? These groups are not very large in the American religious landscape. If you smash all of them together, Jews, Mormons, Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists, you get less than 10% of America combined, um, slightly larger than atheists. So just keep that in mind. But here's that same graph for just college age students, 18 to 22 years old. The number one religious group amongst 18 to 22 year olds is nothing in particular. The most popular religious group in America today amongst young people is, I don't care. I mean, that's really what it is. It's none of the above. They're not atheists. They're not, not and look at this. So 7% of young people are atheists and 6% are agnostic. It's 6% and 5% of the general population, okay? So to think that young people are just, you know, teeming with atheists and agnostics, they're not. They're actually at the same, basically the same level as the general population. You know, the difference is that nothing in particular group is much larger and the Protestant group is much smaller amongst young people. Just one in five young people, college age people say they're Protestant, one in five. Um, which is, you know, insane to think about from where we were just a few years ago. So nothing in particular is the number one religious group amongst young people on your campus right now. That is probably the most prevalent religious group. Um, so why is America changing so rapidly? My thesis, which I argue in my new book, is it's not people losing their religion. It's just people never being born with religion in the first place. This graph is people who were um, who entered adulthood as nuns meaning they did not pick it up along the way, that they were 18 to 25-year-old and they were already nuns by their 25th birthday. As you can see, about a third of Americans today, born in between 1990 and 1994, enter adulthood without any religious tradition, which means they're not shuffling off Christianity. They just never put it on. So what's happening is generational replacement. Old people are dying who are you know 70% Catholic Protestant. They're being replaced by the next generation, which are 45% nuns. Every day, someone dies, someone's replaced. And as that happens, America becomes less religious over time. This isn't a massive, like, run away from religion, you know, through adulthood. It's just people are never that religious to begin with and never pick it up along the way. Uh, oh, yeah, by race, um, Asians are clearly the most likely to be nuns. 40% of Asians have no religious affiliation. Uh, it was 30% just 12 years or 10 years ago. You see, Hispanics are actually the most religious group, uh, racial group in America today. And I think it's largely because they're Catholic and Catholic's a cultural thing, like we talked about more than a religious thing. So, um, but around a third of white people say they're nuns today, which is um, sort of right in the middle of the distribution. So one of the big contributions I make from the book is that not all nuns are created equal. Um, there are three types. There are your atheists, there are your agnostics, and there are your nothing in particulars. Uh, and these groups are dramatically different, especially between atheist agnostics on one hand and nothing in particulars on the other hand. Let me show you what I mean by that. Um, so this is how those groups have risen over time. About 6% of Americans are atheists, 5% are agnostics, and about 21% are nothing in particulars. The, the nuns rose about 0.7% between 2019 and 2020, which is kind of exactly what we would expect. The fastest growing religious group in America today are nothing in particular as they grew six points in 12 years. That's insane if you think about it. Remember we talked about how big Muslims are and Mormons and Buddhists. Think about 6% compared to, you know, that's, that's Muslims, Mormons, Buddhists, and Hindus put together, 6%. Um, so we're talking a huge growth 
over the last uh, 10 or 12 years, just in the nothing particular category, alongside the atheist agnostics growing at, at the same time. So now we put it all together and the nuns today are about a third of America. I think Pew pegs them about 30%. I would say it's a little bit higher than that. I would say probably 32, 33% as the right number uh, of nuns. This is a graph I just made actually yesterday and I tweeted it out. I want to seem to like it. So I'll put it up here. Um, this is the age distribution of a bunch of different traditions. The average American, adult American today is 48.4 years old. So I put that vertical line. So you can see every tradition to the left of that are old, um, older than the average American. Every tradition to the right are younger than the average American. Um, as you can see, atheists are the oldest, 44.4 years old. Agnostics are a little bit younger, 43.5. And then nothing in particular is are, are even younger than that, 42.5. The average nothing in particular is basically the youngest besides Hindus and Muslims in America today. So very, very young, um, nothing in particular is are compared to, on the other hand, 53% of evangelicals are 55 and older, 53%. So which means the next 30 years, most evangelicals will be dead um, just from a mathematical actuarial standpoint. Most um, evangelicals will be dead in the next, and mainline Protestants, by the way, are the same boat, and Catholics aren't far behind. So, you know, as we can see, and look at Muslims and Hindus on the other side, right? Very low. You know, the average age there is in the 30s, and look how many people are very young, and they have a lot of kids. I wrote a whole post about that one time, too. Um, so, this is the share of each tradition that's male. Atheists hate when I put this graph up, they hate it um, because they're so white male. 48% of all atheists are white dudes. They're such a white male tradition. Um, and I, in the book I talk about, if you go on Amazon and look at the Amazon 25 bestsellers in the atheist category, 21 of the 25 when I checked were written by white men. So for, for a, a religion that talks about wokeness and diversity, they are incredibly not, not diverse, um, gender-wise or racial-wise. 54% um, of agnostics are men and 48% of nothing particular is men, which is right around the average, obviously. So this is, I think, really, really telling them. This is the share of each tradition that has a bachelor's degree or more. As you can see, atheists are one of the most educated religious traditions in America today. 46% of all atheists have a four-year college degree. 43% um, of agnostics, so very, very high. They really only trail Jews and Hindus. And remember, those traditions are a lot smaller than they are. So, you know, a lot of highly educated people here. Look at the very bottom of the graph, though. Only 21% of nothing in particulars have a four-year college degree. They're the least educated religious group in America today, and that's been true for the last 10 years. Um, they have very, very low levels of education that nothing in particulars do. And that shows up when it comes to income as well. About 60% of nothing in particulars make less than $50,000 a year as a household, which means that most nothing in particulars are in poverty. Um, Compare that to atheists, only 40% make less than 50K. But look, if you look at the 100K or more, 12.7% of nothing in particular make 100K or more. It's 25% of atheists. So atheists are twice as likely to make six figures as nothing in particular are. So we talk about the nuns not being the same. They are not the same. Education-wise, nothing in particular are very uneducated. They have very low incomes. Atheists have a lot of education, a lot of income. We think about the nuns, I think we think about the atheists a lot. But remember, most nuns are nothing in particular. Three in five nuns are nothing in particular. So most nuns don't look like atheists or agnostics. Um, this is them politically. As you can see, atheists are in the bottom, bottom left there, I suppose. Um, they are very proud of their liberal stances. Um, atheists, are, I think for a lot of atheists, they're actually very... Um, that's become their religion is liberal politics and progressive politics. Um, agnostics are not far behind. I call them like diet atheists, like atheist light. They're slightly less liberal. Um, but look at nothing in particular. Do you know where they are? Smack in the middle of the spectrum, slightly left of center, but really kind of in the middle, which by the way, most Americans are slightly, the average American is slightly left of center politically. I don't know. I know everyone talks about like, oh, America's a center right nation. We're not. We're actually center left nation. And that's where nothing in particular is are is sort of left more towards the Democrats, but not overwhelmingly uh, towards the Democrats. When you look at political stuff, like things like meetings and protests and marches, what you see overwhelmingly is that atheists and agnostics do a ton of that, and nothing particular is dumb. Um, they are just incredibly politically disengaged. So think about this portrait, right? We have a group that has very low education, that has very low income, that is not politically engaged. That's not a recipe for success going forward. 
That's a recipe for scaredness as a social scientist and as a pastor. So this is a group that I worry about quite a lot, and I wonder why we haven't talked about them more um, over time. Church attendance, um, about 38% of um, nothing in particular said they go to church at least a little bit, more than, you know, once a year or more. So they're not completely turned off for religion. And if you look at religious importance, you know, about 35% of uh, nothing in particular say religion is at least somewhat important to them. So these are not like anti-religious people. Obviously, amongst atheist agnostics, it's, you know, none of them care about it, right? Um, so they're, they're not turned off to religion. I think that's the key. They are still amenable to religion. Um, by the way, this is belief in God. Um, Gen Z does not believe in God with any certainty, FYI. Just not, not here for it. Um, the, Gen X is actually, interestingly enough, Gen X is, I think actually Gen X is the last religious generation in American history. Um, predominantly religious uh, in, in terms of belief. Millennials look a lot more like Gen Z than they do look like um, Gen X. I think millennials are sort of the bridge to secularism. Um, Gen X looks like boomers. Millennials look like nothing else. And then Gen Z looks like a much more secular version of, of millennials. So this is what I really want to really want to take a minute to talk about. So I looked at panel data. Panel data is where we ask the same people the same questions across a, a, a long period of time. This was done in 2010, 12, and 14. So I looked at how the nuns described themselves in 2010 and then how they described themselves in 2014, okay? So what you see is that uh, amongst atheists who were atheists in 2010, 81% of them were still atheists in 2014, and then 13% became nothing in particulars. The, the share that became Christians amongst atheists was less than one in 100, 0.7%, which is a rounding error. So maybe someone filled out the form incorrectly, I would assume. So the whole thing of like, I was an atheist, and then I had a, an argument with a Christian. I was like, then I became a Christian. That's all garbage. That doesn't happen. All right, statistically an, an anomalous uh, incident. Agnostics are not far behind. Um, almost all agnostics say agnostics are atheists or nuns. Four years later, 3.6% become Christians and 2.9% go to another faith group. But the top row is the most interesting row to me. That's nothing in particular. So four years later, 62% of nothing in particular were still nothing in particular, okay? 13% of them became atheists or agnostics, but 25% of them came back to a theistic tradition with 16% becoming Christians and 8.4% becoming something of an other faith group. So think about this. 25% uh, of the nothing in particulars become, you know, religious people over a four-year period of time. That's 25% of 20% of the population. That's 5% of America goes from being a nun to a sum over a four-year period of time. This is a huge group we're talking about. 5% is almost more than all the atheists in America combined. So we're talking about a huge group here. When I talk to pastors, I say, that's the group to target. They're the kind of group that will listen because they come to church. Sometimes some of them think religion is at least a little bit important. Um, and they do switch over time. Atheist agnostics do not do those things. They stay where they are. This is what I think America looks like. You have religious people on one side, making up about 68% of America. You have the, the nuns, the nun nuns, atheist agnostics on the other side, making up about 12% of America. And in the mushy middle, you have the nothing in particulars. They're, to me, like the transfer category in American religion. Most people, it seems like, who go from being a Christian to being an, an atheist go through the nothing in particular category first. So it's really sort of a, a pass-through station between theism and nothing on one side and the other side. And I really think that's where the battle of American religion is happening, is in that nothing in particular category and will continue to happen. And remember, amongst young people, that's a third of them are in the nothing in particular category. So an even bigger battle, an even bigger transfer station between something and nothing in that nothing in particular category. So some takeaways. Listen. I think that the secularization and globalization have a lot in common. I think they're both inevitable. I think you can't do you can do nothing to stop them. In the book, I talk about how we tried to all the efforts by different politicians to try to stop globalization have all been for not. Um, it's just not going to happen. We are going to be a less Christian country in the next ten years than we were today, and that's just inevitable. And at some point, you have to just go, okay, that's what it is. It's not because I'm a bad person or I'm a bad pastor or the church failed, which are all things true in my life at least. That doesn't necessarily mean your church is going to grow if you do a better job. There's too many headwinds going on for too many people right now. The other thing is, and this is something I always want to talk to pastors about, especially is I'm a social scientist, so I have to talk broadly about people. 
But for 60 million people, there, if there's 60 million nuns in America, there's 60 million stories. And those stories can be everything from was I was LGBT and my parents kicked me out because I, you know, I had a boyfriend, which is awful. And don't come back to a church that abuses you, by the way. Absolutely not. I think that's terrible. And I will never advise anyone to ever do that. But there, I think there's a whole group of people in America today. I would probably say at least 15% who stopped going to church because they, the church service moved up an hour or they didn't like a sermon that was preached or they just got too lazy to go right? There's silly reasons why they're not coming back to church. They're not grounded in sort of like trauma or harm. It's just they feel like the church didn't do anything for them. So understand that every single person has a different story of how they left their faith or how they never came to faith in the first place. So listen to them. Really, really hear them and what they have to say. I do in the books talk about pastors. You got to stop being so unbelievably partisan, especially on social media. What are you doing? You know, Michael Jordan was asked why he's not more political. And he said, well, because Republicans buy, buy sneakers too, right? You know, the gospel's for everyone. It's for everyone. I believe it is. I believe it's for everyone. It belongs to Republicans and Democrats and independents and, you know, nut job weirdos and everyone, everyone in the gospel's for everyone. So stop being partisan. By doing that, what you're saying is half my, my potential audience does not belong here. They don't, they don't fit in, in, my, in my congregation. So stop being so partisan. I talk in the book about this, this overarching theory I think pastors should talk about more, which is Imago Dei, this, this old, old idea that every human being is born in the image and likeness of God. And what that means is we should care about the unborn, yes, but we should also should care about the immigrant and the disabled and those struggling in poverty, right? Every human being deserves, um, you know, care and respect. And then um, I end with the parable of the sower, which is one of my favorite parables. It's the idea that our job is just to throw seed. It's not to make it grow. That's, that's someone else's responsibility. And a lot of our seed we're throwing now is falling on bad ground and not growing. But we got to keep throwing that seed because you never know when it's going to fall on the right ground and, and yield a bountiful harvest, as the scriptures say. So we must never tire of doing what is good and right. And 1042, Rob, I'm going to stop there for questions. Wow, that was really, really helpful. My goodness, uh, you've given us so much to think about. So I would invite people to either put a question in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, I will launch us into questions. I was really taken by the economic level of the nuns. Mm -hmm. I would have not, I would have assumed quite the opposite. Um, do you have any insights on like the connection of poverty and non- being a nun, I mean, is it the idea that like people are working seven days a week and can't go to church and then don't see it as an identity or? Yeah, so I wrote a piece for Christianity Today where I broke um, the incomes into, into four different quartiles. And if you look at church attendance over time, what you see is the group that is leaving church the most are the people in the bottom quartile of the income spectrum, right? So the church has basically become a, and people don't believe when I tell you, in, in the book, I, in the next book, I talk about this. People act like religion is for poor, dumb people. Like that's what the, especially a lot of atheist friends are like, oh, it's for a bunch of idiots who don't know what they're talking about. If you actually look at the numbers, the people who are in church more are the educated and the high income. They're the ones staying in church because I think what they realize is there's a, there's a ton of social value that comes from being part of a religious organization where you have connections with people, right? And I think for the poor, it's because a lot of them, A, um, just don't have time because they're working, you know, three, four jobs, you know, six, seven days a week, and they just don't have one time. I think the other part is a lot of them don't feel welcome because if the church is just full of a bunch of people like me, you know, white collar educated, you know, upwardly mobile people, they don't feel like they fit in. But I actually think in some ways it actually hurts them worse. Um, because, you know, I was in a, in a congregation once where we did prayers for the people, you know, where the everyone can just kind of say what they're what we need to pray for. And one guy in the back was a 22-year-old kid, had a baby, you know, married, young and everything. And he said, could you all pray for me? I lost my job last week and I don't know how we're going to pay the rent. Well, after church was over, one of the older guys in the congregation who owned a small business came up to the kid and said, hey, you want to come work for me? And the kid got a job there and sort of, you know, he bounced back very quickly because of the connection, you know, the social connection that he made in that congregation. And I think in some ways, and, and I don't want to blame anyone for anyway, but I think in some ways, the poverty they're in is actually made worse by the fact they don't have a social network in the community that can kind of help them bounce back because we're so socially isolated. It's hard to ask for help. It's hard to know who to ask for help. But in a church, everyone is basically willing to help you if they can, 
And so I think it actually is sort of making, and actually in, the, in my third book, if I ever get around to it, I'm going to make the argument, I think, that it's actually made income inequality worse in this country. You know, the lack of religion has actually made income inequality worse, and the rich are getting richer because they're networked and connected, and the poor are getting poorer because they're not networked and connected. And I don't know a good solution to that, but I think it's a very real thing. Insightful, thank you. Other questions that people may have? So uh, what would be a strategy possibly to, um, let's see, maybe, uh, I wouldn't want to say brand, but, you know, what are some ways you've learned as a pastor, even just as like a, you know, somebody who social networks a lot in terms of getting college kids, not necessarily into church, but maybe connecting them with the community? I think creating many, many opportunities to connect that are easy, low impact, um, and are easily, um, they don't feel like they have to like commit to a lot of things. I think a, a, a lot of, even I'm in the same way. I'm like, you want me to do what now? How, how many hours do I have to work on this? You know, like I'm always very conscious of my time. I think young people are the same way. I think you've got to make it low impact, uh, not awkward as much as possible. Um, and by I mean low impact to them, but high impact to the community. They really need to see their work doing good things immediately and tangibly, like you're doing good stuff for people. And so in the book, I tell the story of our church, which, like I said, is about 10 people now. We do a brown bag Friday program. We pack up about 200 brown bags of food, has 10 items in it. We send it to the local school because my the school my kids go to has, is, has 85% of kids on free or reduced lunch. It's one of the poorest districts in the state. Um, anyway, so we give out these bags. We put a little card in it. It says, we're First Baptist Church. We love you. We don't know you. If you need anything from us, just call, and we'll try to help you as best we can. Well, on one Friday afternoon, uh, we got a call at the church, and it was this grandmother who was care of her grandson. And she said, you know, it's about this time of year, and winter was coming, and she didn't have a coat and couldn't afford one for her grandson. Could we help? And we just so happened to be having a rummage sale, our fellowship hall, that weekend. So we literally had racks and racks of clothes. And we, you know, we said, please come in before anybody else can come in and buy anything. We want to give you whatever you want to take. And so her, the grandmother and then the, and the little boy came in and they filled up three bags of clothes and took them uh, with them. Never got the kid's name, never got the grandma's name, didn't even ask, didn't even care to ask. But what I say is, you know, that kid probably goes throughout the rest of his life knowing he might still not go to church. And that's fine. But at least he knew that the church looked out for him when no one else did. And that we cared for him, even though that we didn't know who he was, because that's our job. You know, I feel like that's our job as Christians. And I think any ministry or any social organization needs to find ways to immediately impact people in very tangible, visible ways that you can see that aren't that much work. Our brown bag program takes about an hour every Friday. So not a huge time commitment. It's easy. It's fun. And I think it helps people. I think churches need to find, and social organizations, by the way, generally need to find more things that don't take 12 hours of seven set up for a one hour event um, that are quick, that are easy and that have huge impact. That's, that's the kind of work that I think young people want to get involved with. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions that people may have? I, I have one other question then Ryan. So, you know, we've been told that sometimes conservative religious traditions have a fear of letting their young people go off to college, get educated and become upwardly mobile, and they will no longer become a part of the faith. Um, is there, a, with your data, is there, is there a truth to that? I, I am not worried about that at all, to be honest with you. And actually one of the chapters in the book is that, you know, the myth is that college drives people away from faith. That's actually not true. If you look at the data, um, kids who went to like, let's, so, so if you look at kids who go to college, they're more likely to be part of a religious tradition by the time they're 25. And they're more likely to attend church than those who did not go to college by the time they're 25. You know, so I think it's this whole idea of like religion is being seen as being part of like the establishment, right? Like go to, you know, go to, go to college, get married, have two kids, live in the white picket fence and the dog and go to church. If you don't do any of those things, then you stop going to church, right? Because you, you kind of fell off the path of respectability or whatever it would be. And so I, I think that whole thing is a, a myth because if you look at the data, there's this old tweet that I think is hilarious. Like all these people think that like college professors are turning all the students into college. I just wanted to read the stinking syllabus for God's sakes. <laughs> I'm going to show up to class most of the time. I'm going to 
by a communist. You know, the biggest impact that, and there's actually a paper that I, I cite in the new book. There's a paper that just came out that said the biggest impact on the po political and religious views of college students is their roommate. Hmm. Their roommate, right? It's almost like if we put you in a place where you're around a bunch of people who think differently and believe differently and look differently than you do, then you become more expansive in your worldview and become more tolerant of other people. Shocking, I know, but it's not. What happens in the classroom is what? 2% of what a college student does during a typical semester. It's everything that happens outside the classroom. And if you tell, if you ask me, should my kid be exposed to people who believe differently than him? Absolutely. You know, people who come from a different racial background, uh, geographic background, different regional, absolutely. These are all things that, that Americans should strive to do. And sheltering kids, I think, is the worst thing that we can do to them. Exposing them to different ideas is the best, because what it does is actually, I think, it creates an inoculation effect where that now they become more aware of what they believe and why they believe it and actually believe it more after they're challenged a little bit by their friends. So I'm a big believer in, in diversity and pluralism. Perfect. And one, we have time for one last question. Uh, Summer, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, so I, um, you know, I've been really thinking about um, where people are finding meaning right now and there's a lot of stuff going on um you know the me too movement um the black lives matter movement you know political divide all of those you know all the tensions that are rampant in um where do you see this nothing in particular movement finding and meeting, making sense of all the things that we're experiencing right now in the country youtube unfortunately um I would, I would recommend you all, if you like podcasts, there's this one from the New York Times called Rabbit. And basically it's about how the algorithms online can drag you down a rabbit hole and make and radicalize you in some ways. And the first episode is about this guy who exactly the kind of person I would say is nothing particular. Small town, went to college for two years, got kicked out for drinking, came back home, lived with his parents, worked at the Dairy Queen. Right. To me, that's like a nothing particular, like in a nutshell. And he talked about how he got pulled into Stefan Molyneux, who's this far right racist, sexist guy. And then six months later, he was like a hardcore Bernie Sanders AOC socialist because he started watching more YouTube videos. You know, so I think what they're being they're, they're, they're lo Everyone's looking for guidance and meaning. And I think YouTube is terrible because it only gives you more of what you like and more of what you want. And without a pastor or a professor or a parent or a spouse to come in and say, whoa, dude, that guy's saying some really nutty things on there. You need to be really careful about that. You'd never sort of have that sober second thought and go, whoa, I, you know, I probably should listen to the other side a little bit and get a little more balanced diet of media. I think that's the problem is these people have no guardrails. And so when they seek meaning, oftentimes they're, 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 they're drug into the extremes. And I think for all of us, I think that's a bad outcome. Like, I think like the January 6th thing is a, a symptom of that. The incel movement, the involuntary celibate movement, where people, these, these white guys are really mad because they can't find a girlfriend. Those are nothing in particular people, right? I think all this is a symptom of this disease, which is we're all searching for meaning. And at least atheists and agnostics have meaning, which is their activism. Nothing in particular don't even have that. And I think we're, they're worse for it. And I think we as a society are worse for it at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Ryan, you've given us so much to think about and just really appreciate your scholarship. Um, you know, just kind of modeling for us uh, real deep scholarship, but also a gift to the church and kind of helping us think through some very important critical issues. Um, if you like what Ryan has said or you want to know more, of course, I encourage you to go back, look at his Twitter account, his book, um, his upcoming book that will be out next year, it sounds like, um, his his online presence. He's all over the place. So you just Google him and you'll find a bunch of stuff out there. Um, also tomorrow, Ryan will be with us at noon in the class that we're having Dr. Browning's uh, spiritual but not religious course. And um, so Ryan, again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun.